You are about to take the institutional test of English as a foreign language. Your scores for this test will be provided only to the institution administering this test. Please remember that your scores cannot be reported officially to any other institution at a later time. Now we will begin the test of English as a foreign language. Break the seal and open your test book to the first page. Read the directions for section one in your test book as you listen to the directions on this recording. Do not read ahead or turn the pages until you are told to do so. Section one, listening comprehension. In this section of the test, you will have an opportunity to demonstrate your ability to understand conversations and talks in English. There are three parts to this section, with special directions for each part. Answer all the questions on the basis of what is stated or implied by the speakers in this test. Do not take notes or write in your test book at any time. Do not turn the pages until you are told to do so. Part A, directions. In Part A, you will hear short conversations between two people. After each conversation, you will hear a question about the conversation. The conversations and questions will not be repeated. After you hear a question, read the four possible answers in your test book and choose the best answer. Then, on your answer sheet, find the number of the question. And fill in the space that corresponds to the letter of the answer you have chosen. Here is an example. On the recording, you hear. I don't like this painting very much. Neither do I. What does the man mean? In your test book, you read. A. He doesn't like the painting either. B. He doesn't know how to paint. C. He doesn't have any paintings. D. He doesn't know what to do. You learn from the conversation that neither the man nor the woman likes the painting. The best answer to the question, "What does the man mean?" is A. He doesn't like the painting either. Therefore, the correct choice is A. Go on to the next page. Now we will begin Part A with the first conversation. Number one. Are you sure you can't make it to Anne's birthday party tonight? I know it'd really make her happy if you could be there. Well, I suppose I could finish up my history report afterwards. What will the man probably do? Number two, we usually have the same taste in books, and you said so many great things about this novel. I was expecting more from it. Well, I read the unabridged version. It has much more description and detail. What does the woman imply? Number three. I've looked in his office, his room, and the cafeteria, and I can't find David anywhere. Lately, he started studying on the third floor of the library. What does the man imply the woman should do? Number four. Ellen hasn't been at work all week. She must really be sick. I don't know about that. I just saw her at the grocery store this morning and didn't notice anything unusual. What does the man imply?
Number five. This chicken dish looks delicious, and so does the seafood special. I just can't make up my mind. Yeah, I'm having the same problem. Everything looks so tempting. What does the woman mean? Number six. My video recorder's on the blink. Do you know anything about these things? Well, I'm not an electrician, but I'd be glad to take a look at it. What will the man probably do? Number seven. Who put all these boxes in the office? Don't look at me. I was wondering the same thing when I got in a few minutes ago. What can be inferred from the conversation? Number eight. Hey, aren't you supposed to be picking up your brother at the airport right about now? Oh my gosh, you're right. Thanks for reminding me. What will the man probably do next? Number nine. What are you doing sitting around the dorm? I thought you were planning on going camping this weekend. Well, I was, but the forecast is calling for severe thunderstorms, and I don't have a waterproof tent. What does the man imply? Number 10. Do you think Matthew will be at Thursday's film club meeting? I wouldn't count on it. He's missed every one so far this month. What does the man imply? Number 11. I heard you got a new job. Me? Hardly. Where in the world did you get that idea? What does the woman mean? Number 12. Mark, do you have a minute to take a look at something in this file? What is it? What does the man want to know? Number 13. I don't know what's wrong with me. About two hours ago, I just really started feeling awful. It could be that tuna sandwich you had for lunch. Hadn't it been sitting out in your car all morning? What does the woman imply? Number 14. What do you think of this green jacket? It's on sale. I want your honest opinion. In that case, I'd advise you to put it back where you got it as quickly as you can. What does the woman mean? Number 15. I sense that you were a little uncomfortable with last night's dinner party. I wouldn't have minded it so much, Mary, if it had been a little less formal. What does the man mean? Number 16. You know, working here just isn't worth it. We work long hours and the pay is peanuts. You don't have to convince me. I've been sending out resumes for over a month now. What does the man imply?
Number 17. I hear that our grant proposal passed the first two reviews. Now it just has to pass the committee for final approval. When it gets to that stage, it's pretty much a done deal. Looks like we'll have funding to get those new computers after all. What does the man mean? Number 18. What's the matter with this camera? Nothing happens when I press the shutter button. Oh, that happened to me before. But you know, I have a coupon for 10% off all services at a camera shop. You can have it. What does the woman imply the man should do? Number 19. Do you happen to have an umbrella? I want to run over to the cafeteria for a quick cup of coffee, but it's pouring outside. Sorry. It was nice and sunny when I left my dorm room this morning. What does the man imply? Number 20. Do you really want this filing cabinet right here, next to the door? Someone might bump into it if they're not looking. Hmm, you're right. Let's see what it looks like over here near the window. What will the speakers probably do? Go on to the next page. Number 21. If I were you, I'd try to get into Professor Wiggin's biology class. Well, I don't know. It's at 8 a.m. three times a week. What does the man imply? Number 22. I've got a big test tomorrow and, well... Would it be okay if I left work a little early tonight so I can go home and study? I suppose so. Business has been slow this evening, and I don't see it picking up any time soon. What does the woman imply? Number 23. We've been working on this project for five hours straight. Why don't we go out and reward ourselves for all our hard work with a pizza? I'd love to, but I'm flat broke. Could you spot me a few bucks till payday on Friday? What does the man want to know? Number 24. What do you think of the three candidates for committee chairperson? All three seem to me like they're really on the ball. What does the woman mean? Number 25. I've noticed you handing out pamphlets in the cafeteria. What's that all about? Oh, I'm just trying to drum up some interest in the campus birdwatching club. What does the man mean? Number 26. You were at the top of the list, Ms. Parker, but when we couldn't reach you, we went ahead and hired our second choice. I guess I didn't exactly pick the best week to go on vacation. What can be inferred about the woman? Number 27. 
I'm terribly sorry to keep you waiting. My meeting at work ran late, and then there was the traffic. There's no need to explain. I just got here myself. What does the man imply? Number 28. You want to see the new play that everyone's been talking about? Well, I read a review of it in the paper this morning, and the gist of it was, don't waste your money. What does the woman imply? Number 29. You remember that brown suit I bought at the department store last week? I took it back this morning and got a full refund. Oh, so you could return it. What can be inferred about the woman? Number 30. What are you going to do? Your paper for Professor Green is due on the same day as our physics project. Well, last term my roommate went to see her about an extension, and she was pretty accommodating. What will the man probably do? This is the end of Part A. Go on to the next page. Now read along as the directions for Part B are being read. Part B. Directions. In this part of the test, you will hear longer conversations. After each conversation, you will hear several questions. The conversations and questions will not be repeated. After you hear a question, read the four possible answers in your test book and choose the best answer. Then. On your answer sheet, find the number of the question and fill in the space that corresponds to the letter of the answer you have chosen. Remember, you are not allowed to take notes or write in your test book. Go on to the next page. Now we will begin Part B with the first conversation. Questions 31 through 35. Listen to a conversation between two students in the university cafeteria. Hey Pam, what you got there, ice cream? Yeah, it's chocolate, my favorite. If I told you what we learned about ice cream in chemistry class today, I'm not so sure you'd still want to eat it. Oh, I don't know about that. Try me. Well, your dessert there is partly made from seaweed. No way! It doesn't taste like seaweed. That's because in one liter of ice cream, there's just one gram of the stuff that comes from seaweed. It's called a stabilizer because they add it to keep the ice cream smooth, you know, to keep it from getting grainy. You mean like when you keep ice cream in the freezer too long and little ice crystals form on it? Exactly. As Professor Williams explained it, when ice cream is made, most of the water content freezes into tiny crystals. As the thermostat in a freezer switches the refrigeration off and on, the temperature in the freezer fluctuates. When the temperature goes up, the crystals melt. When it goes back down and they begin to freeze again, the water from various tiny crystals comes together to form bigger and bigger ones. So what do these stabilizers do? Well, they form a protective layer around the tiny crystals that keeps them from growing any bigger. And without these ice crystals, the ice cream stays smooth and creamy. So how do they add these stabilizers? They don't just chop up seaweed and throw it in the ice cream, do they? Well, no, it's not really the seaweed itself, just an extract that gets into the ice cream. You see, first the seaweed is harvested and dried out. Then they soak it in hot water to draw out what's called the extract. This seaweed extract is dried out and ground into a fine cream-colored powder. And it's that powdered extract that winds up in ice cream. I see. I'm just glad it doesn't taste like seaweed. 
Number 31. What are the speakers mainly discussing? Number 32. Where did the man learn about stabilizers? Number 33. Why are stabilizers added to ice cream? Number 34. What causes the formation of ice crystals in ice cream? Number 35. In what form is the seaweed extract added to ice cream? Questions 36 through 39. Listen to part of a conversation between two students. Hi, Michelle. What are you doing downtown? Don't you have classes this afternoon? Oh, for this semester? Not on Mondays and Wednesdays. I have an internship at an engineering firm down on 7th Street. Hey, that's great. How many hours a week? Just 10. I'm there from 12 to 5 on Monday and Wednesday afternoons. So, is it hard? Nah. It's mostly just office work. Filing, data entry, running errands. Like right now, I'm taking some papers over to a client. That doesn't sound too interesting. Well, the stuff they have me doing is kind of boring, but just being in the office is great. The engineers in the firm work on all different kinds of projects, so even though I'm just doing little tasks, I get to work on a lot of different projects. It's giving me a pretty good idea of what it'd be like to be an engineer in this kind of company. Is it the kind of place you want to work after you graduate? Well, I don't graduate for another two years, but yeah, that's part of what this internship is for, to help me figure that out. And of course, no matter where I want to work, it'll look good on my resume. So, how did you find out about it anyway? You know, I really need to drop off these papers. Can we talk another time? Oh, sure. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to keep you. That's okay. I'll see you later. Number 36. What are the students mainly discussing? Number 37. When does the woman work for the engineering firm? Number 38. What does the woman imply about the tasks she performs at the engineering firm? Number 39. What will the woman probably do next? This is the end of Part B. Go on to the next page. Now read along as the directions for Part C are being read. Part C Directions In this part of the test, you will hear several short talks. After each talk, you will hear some questions. The talks and the questions will not be repeated. After you hear a question, read the four possible answers in your test book and choose the best answer. Then, on your answer sheet, find the number of the question and fill in the space that corresponds to the letter of the answer you have chosen. Here is an example. On the recording, you hear. 
Listen to an instructor talk to his class about a television program. I'd like to tell you about an interesting TV program that'll be shown this coming Thursday. It'll be on from 9 to 10 p.m. on Channel 4. It's part of a series called Mysteries of Human Biology. The subject of the program is the human brain, how it functions and how it can malfunction. Topics that will be covered are dreams, memory, and depression. These topics are illustrated with outstanding computer animation that makes the explanations easy to follow. Make an effort to see this show. Since we've been studying the nervous system in class, I know you'll find it very helpful. Now listen to a sample question. What is the main purpose of the program? In your test book, you read A. To demonstrate the latest use of computer graphics. B. To discuss the possibility of an economic depression. C. To explain the workings of the brain. D. To dramatize a famous mystery story. The best answer to the question, what is the main purpose of the program, is C. To explain the workings of the brain. Therefore, the correct choice is C. Now listen to another sample question. Why does the speaker recommend watching the program? In your test book, you read, A. It is required of all science majors. B. It will never be shown again. C. It can help viewers improve their memory skills. D. It will help with coursework. The best answer to the question, Why does the speaker recommend watching the program? is D. It will help with coursework. Therefore, the correct choice is D. Remember, you are not allowed to take notes or write in your test book. Go on to the next page. Now we will begin Part C with the first talk. Questions 40 through 43. Listen to a talk in a biology class. So, we were talking about adaptation, how the environment favors certain traits of a species over other traits. In other words, these adaptive traits give a species a better chance to survive and reproduce in that environment. One way a species survives in a specific environment is through physical adaptation. Consider the white-tailed deer. This deer lives throughout North America. In the north, it has long legs and can jump quite high and run fast through a forest, traits that help it escape predators. But in Florida, the white-tailed deer live in marshes. In these wetlands, it's more important to be able to hide than to run fast. In Florida, the white-tailed deer are smaller, so small that they can hide in the marsh grass. But adaptations are not just physical. Here's an example of an adaptive behavior. There's a species of seagull which does something quite remarkable. When an egg breaks in its nest, the parents remove the broken bits of shell. Now, most bird species don't do this. But these seagulls build their nests on the ground, and they have a large number of predators. Well, experiments show that the whiteness of the insides of these bird shells attracts predators. When researchers painted the outsides of the eggs white, the number of eggs lost to predators increased. Other experiments showed that when the broken eggshells were moved far away from a nest, the baby birds inside were safer. So here's a pretty unusual behavior that, repeated from one generation to the next, clearly enhances the survival chances of the species. Number 40. What does the professor mainly discuss? Number 41. What characteristic of the Florida white-tailed deer allows it to escape predators? Number 42. 
Number 42. What happened when researchers painted the outside of seagulls' eggs white? Number 43. What does the professor conclude from the experiments with seagulls? Questions 44 through 47. Listen to part of a talk about a novel called The Pioneers, a story about life in the United States in the late 1700s. We've talked about character and setting in The Pioneers, and now I'd like to discuss how some themes of the novel are linked to the setting of the Western frontier. Last week, we described the late 1700s as a period of great social change in the United States, where areas of wilderness, populated originally by Native American peoples, came to be inhabited by European settlers who formed their own communities. In The Pioneers, these settlers begin to develop their own kind of frontier culture as they interact with Native Americans and learn some of their ways, and as more Europeans arrive and become part of the new community. The culture of these settlers isn't simply imported from Europe. Their independence, the challenges of their new environment, and their exposure to new ways of thinking enable them to interpret the social teachings of their ancestors in a new, distinctly American way. For example, let's look at the idea of aristocracy in the novel. In European aristocracies, the basis for political power was heredity. The power to govern was handed down from parent to child for generations, without regard for the child's worthiness or competence. But in the frontier community of European settlers portrayed in the pioneers, there's kind of a, uh, what you might call, a democratic aristocracy. We see the most capable people becoming leaders by right of their achievements. The novel demonstrates the advantages of this new kind of aristocracy over the European kind, but it also teaches that its members have special duties, such as the duty to protect the poorest and least able in the community from harm. In fact, maybe the most important point conveyed in the novel is that each individual is worthwhile, that everyone has something to contribute, and it's the responsibility of this new aristocracy to recognize and respect the contributions that each individual has to make. Number 44. What aspect of the pioneers is the talk mainly about? Number 45. What does the professor say about Native American peoples on the frontier? Number 46. Why does the professor discuss the concept of aristocracy? Number 47. According to the professor, what responsibility did the leaders of the community of European settlers have? Questions 48 through 50. Listen to part of a talk in a marketing class. As part of our unit on low-priced retailing, I want to talk a moment about the way chain stores originated. High-volume retailing might seem new, 